Hello everyone, welcome again. So today's lesson will be on the chemical earth in the year 11 chemistry syllabus. And today's lesson and this series will be on properties and bonding. So we're going to look at sort of how elements and compounds bond together and how that alters their properties in terms of their chemical and physical properties. But before we go into that, we're going to go to today's lesson, which is on the properties of substances. So this lesson will focus on what are the general properties of some of the chemicals that we see and how do we classify certain chemicals so that we can sort of group different chemicals together and sort of predict their properties in the future. Okay. So firstly, we talk about properties of matter. So the properties of a particular chemical will change based on what that chemical is. Okay, so if the chemical is an element or a compound or a mixture, those three things which we'll define in a second, well, their properties will be very different from one another. Okay, so an element will have very different properties to a compound, and a compound may have different properties to a mixture, and vice versa. Right? So while they could have similar properties, um, it's likely that they don't. Okay? So each member of these categories will generally share the same sort of properties. Okay, so lots of elements will share similar properties to other elements. Um, obviously, there are some that don't. And lots of compounds, if they're of the same type of compound, should show similar characteristics. Okay, so you expect that if we're in any of these groups, that we'd have a similar sort of property that we can sort of pick between them. Okay. So the first type. Well, the first group that we're going to look at is the elements. And this is probably the easiest one to understand because it's the simplest um, of those groups, chemically and also sort of logically. So an element is basically any substance that has only one type of atom inside it. Okay? So this crystal here is a sulfur crystal. And inside that crystal, what we expect is that every single atom will be a sulfur atom. There won't be any other atoms inside. There won't be any oxygen or gold or anything like that. It's just sulfur. Okay? And that's how we know it's an element, because we know there's only sulfur atoms inside. So if you were to take a bar of gold um, from Fort Knox or something, then you would see that the gold bar would only have gold atoms in it, um, with the exception of alloys. We'll get to that in a sec. But if you had a pure block of gold, it would only have gold atoms in it. Okay? And that's what makes up an element. It's just a substance that only has one type of atom inside it. Now, the physical properties of elements vary greatly depending on what the element is. Okay? So if you imagine copper, copper is an element. Uh, it's this nice sort of malleable metal. It's quite strong in certain regards. It's very electrically conductive, it, and we use it for wires. And that's an element. But oxygen is also an element, and it's a gas. And it's colorless, it's an electrical insulator, and it, we use it to breathe. So you can see that the physical properties are very different between two things that are both considered elements. And that's why the periodic table is so useful to us, because it helps us to develop trends in physical properties and chemical properties as well. So you can see just from that that elements will have very different physical properties depending on what they are. Okay. Also, if we look at chemical properties, chemical properties also vary widely um, between the elements. For instance, sodium is a very reactive metal, but gold is not a reactive metal. So you can see that instantly there, there's chemical differences between the two. Okay. But if we were to take any sample of an element, we could predict its chemical properties if we were to split it up into other samples because it's all the same atom. Okay? That's what makes elements so simple because if we chop it up into half, we expect that one half will have the same properties as the other half because they're the same atom. Okay? And that helps us to define an element. So moving on now to compounds. So here we have like a diagram and you can see the different colored circles tell us that there's a different element, and the white bars are just a bond. Okay, So you can see this is a compound. And a compound is basically anything that's composed of two or more elements that are chemically bonded together. Now I say or more because you can see here this is a compound, but there's at least sort of one, two, three, four different elements in this compound. Okay, 
Um, this big white circle, I'm assuming, is different to this small white circle, just if you're wondering. So compounds have at least two different elements or more. You could have as many as you want bonded together. And the key here is chemically as well. So they're bonded chemically to one another. Now, of course, the physical properties of a compound will depend on what the compound is made out of. Okay, So if the compound is made out of two gases, it may be different. Its properties may be different to both of those gases. So it's hard to predict what the compound's physical properties will be like. But there are ways to sort of um, predict that. And we'll cover them in future lessons. However, in general, did I say this in general, so just keep that in mind. Most chemical compounds are not electrically conductive. That's just one thing that we've noticed. Um, and there is a reason why, and that will be covered as we cover more and more bonding. So the more, so when we actually get into the whole bond, the idea of bonding, you'll see why a lot of compounds won't be electrically conductive. Okay. Now the chemical properties for particular compounds are fixed. Okay, so if I was to get magnesium oxide, which is a compound, and then another sample of magnesium oxide from somewhere else on the planet, I would expect that their chemical and physical properties would be exactly the same, similar to an element. Right? If we chop an element in half, we would expect the same properties. So the same thing applies. So another example, NaCl will have the same properties as any other sample of NaCl. Okay? Lastly, mixtures. The last grouping is mixtures. So the reason why I've got this little steel mill guy and not a cool diagram is because a lot of the alloys that we use, so like steel or brass, bronze, they're all alloys. And an alloy is just a mixture. And what a mixture is, is basically two things mixed together in any ratio that you can think of. Okay? And the physical properties depend on the components of the mixture and the relative concentration of the components. Okay? So these two things that you've mixed together, if you've got more of one thing than the other, that will affect the properties of that mixture. Okay? Uh, similarly, if you had more of the other one, then you'd affect the properties of the mixture as well. Okay? And we'll give you examples. Steel, essentially, is a mixture of iron and carbon. So when we refine the steel, we basically put carbon into the iron. So adding more carbon will change the mechanical properties of the steel. Okay? So if I put a lot of carbon in, the steel becomes more brittle and um, it will tend to shatter rather than, well not, maybe not shatter, but it will break more easily than other types of steel which will more likely bend. Okay? Or if I put less carbon in, then it will be more flexible and it will be stronger. Okay? So there's sort of a differing amount of um, carbon will give you differing properties. And similarly, the chemical properties vary with different concentrations of components as well. So if you have, for instance, um, a mixture and you wanted to react it with something, the actual chemical properties of it could vary based on how much of a particular component you have. And we'll give you one example. If you have ethanol and water mixed together, um, if you have a lot of water, obviously it won't be flammable. Okay, so uh, if you for beer, for instance, has alcohol, ethanol, and water, and if you try to light that on fire, it won't work, right? Because there's not enough alcohol to light, to ignite. There's too much water. Now, if you went to a very high concentration of ethanol, so let's say 95% um, ethanol and 5% water, you could probably light that on fire because there's enough alcohol now to burn. So you can see the chemical properties differ depending on how much water or ethanol I have in the solution. So you can see that that sort of helps us define what a mixture is. So you can have any, any concentration or any uh, ratio of components in a mixture, whereas co compounds have fixed composition. You, NaCl will always be one sodium, one chloride. If you don't have two sodiums and a chloride, it's always one sodium, one chloride. Whereas in a mixture, I could have you know, any ratio of things that I want. Okay? So that concludes today's lesson on mixtures, compounds, and elements. We looked at the properties of them and how they change when we move from one group to another. 
So move on to the question segment now, and we'll hopefully be able to answer some questions. So why do particular compounds and elements have constant chemical properties while mixtures do not? Okay, so that's a good opening question. Well, the chemical properties of a substance are defined by the chemical composition of that substance. Okay, so the chemical properties of a particular thing are defined by what is inside that particular thing. Okay. Now, elements and compounds have a set composition. That is, the thing, the atoms that make up a compound or an element will always be the same. Okay, they'll always, uh, they won't change, and so that means that the composition is fixed. So either one, so either only one atom is in an element, or in a compound you have one set of elements. You don't have a variety of elements that could make up this compound. It's just one set. Okay. Now since the composition can't change, the chemical properties of a particular compound or element can't change either. Because remember, from this first statement, the chemical properties of a substance are defined by its composition. Now since the composition can't change, obviously the, uh, the chemical properties don't change either. Now mixtures don't have a set composition, so their chemical properties can actually vary with the varying concentration of components. Okay? Because of that variance, it gives you variance in their chemical properties as well. Now describe one physical property that can be altered in a mixture by altering the composition of that mixture. So a physical property that we can change if we alter the composition of the mixture. Okay, so here's an easy one. The electrical conductivity of salt water can be altered by changing the concentration of salt in the water. So if I have a lot of salt in the water, it will be more conductive than if I have very little salt. So increasing the concentration of salt increases the conductivity. Decreasing the concentration of salt obviously will decrease the conductivity as well. Okay? So that's just one example of that happening. The steel example, if we add more carbon, it becomes more brittle. Um, or if you take away carbon, it becomes more malleable. So that's another one. And so those are some typical examples of things, or physical properties that we can change by changing the composition of the mixture. So why are alloys of metals considered mixtures? So when we alloy metals, we actually are putting, we have a molten block of metal, and then we're putting in other elements to try and alter that metal so it becomes more useful to us. Okay. So alloys are simply metals mixed with other elements to alter the properties of the original metal. So in the steel case, iron is mixed with carbon to make the carbon or to make the steel to make the iron stronger, uh, and we call that steel. So the main idea is that the composition of the alloy can vary depending on the application. So depending on what we want to do, we can actually alter the composition of that alloy. For example, steel can have numerous compositions depending on the application. However, all of the compositions are referred to as steel. Okay, so I'll give you an example. There's the carbon example, putting more carbon in or less carbon. But we also have things like stainless steel. I'm sure you, you use that in your kitchen or whatever. And stainless steel is still called steel, but it's got a different composition to other steels. Okay, so, but we still call it steel. Now therefore, alloys must be mixtures because the com chemical composition is variable. You can change the chemical composition, but we still call it that same mixture of steel. So you can see that they must be mixtures because you can change them however you want. They're not fixed in their composition. Okay? So that's why we consider alloys as mixtures. What are the largest factors affecting the chemical properties of elements and compounds? For elements, the main factor affecting the chemical properties is their electron configuration. So how the electrons sit around the nucleus basically explains their chemical properties. Unstable conf configurations will affect the chemical properties of the element. In compounds, the way the, chemical, the elements bond together, so the chemical bonding, will be the biggest factor in determining their chemical properties. So the way the elements are actually arranged and bonded will affect its chemical properties as well. So when elements combine to form a compound, the compound has properties which differ to the properties of the elements used to make the compound. 
Okay, so these are quite verbose questions. But basically, when elements form compounds, the compound is different to the elements that went into the compound. Okay? So explain why that's so. So when an element combines with another element, it forms a compound, obviously. And this compound has different chemical properties because its electron configuration is different to the constituent chemicals. So obviously, if you bonded things together, you've rearranged the electrons somehow. And that's caused the electrons configuration to be different, which means that obviously the chemical properties will be different. It is the electron configuration that governs the chemical properties of the material. So obviously, if you've changed it, the material will have a different chemical property to its constituents. Okay? So that concludes today's lesson on basically elements, compounds, and mixtures. We've looked at what constitutes each one, and we've looked at what kind of examples do we see in everyday life. So in the future, we'll be talking about chemical bonding and why that happens. And so I look forward to seeing you at our next lesson. Thank you.